Obviously, that was one of your more favorite games yeah. uh, of your career. What's one more that just sticks out top of your mind? You're like, man, that was that was really cool. Definitely my last game, and I almost get teared out just thinking about it. But um, it was my it was my last game as a Sooner, but my first game to ever play under Bob Stoops. And it was his last game that he's coached as a college football coach ever. And so to come in with the guy who recruited you and to go out with him was, I don't know, it was, it was just something special about that. Cause college football tees, college basketball tees, whatever you need, Mercury has you covered with the best merch out there. We're talking about high quality clothing, inexpensive, and the best part is I have a 15% discount for everybody who goes and gets some right now. Use the code below, hit the link in the description, and go get your merch now. Use the code to get 15% off. What are you waiting on? Go do it. Sooner fans, welcome back to another episode of the Dial It Up Pod. I'm your host, Trevor Knight, and today is going to be a fun one. We've got a couple guys on co-hosting with me today. You guys saw him last week on the pod. Is my twin brother and former Sooner, Connor Knight, and our esteemed guest of the week is uh, none other than a guy from out east, went to high school in North Carolina, multiple-time Big 12, uh, uh, all Big 12 selection, on both the academic and the athletic side. Uh, a lot like our first guest, Dimitri Flowers, and even Connor here. They play tight end. They play H-back. They play fullback. They can take all three of those names and, and turn it into the one. They, uh, they're they a Swiss Army knife for the Sooners, which has been a staple position over the last several years and in different offenses for the Sooners. But super excited to welcome in today Jeremiah Hall. Before we dive into it, though, guys, remember, always follow us on social media uh, at Red Dirt Media Co. and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. And we're going to be rolling all off season, getting into spring ball here coming up. And then obviously when the 2024 season starts, the first year in the SEC, we'll be recapping every single week. So without further ado, Jeremiah Hall. Jeremiah, how are we doing today, my man? What's up, Trev? What's up, Connor? The Knights. <laughs> There he is. Right. I'm happy to be. It's so nice to be on the other side of a podcast, bro. Because I don't, I don't know pe people who don't have podcasts don't understand how tedious it can be. Sometimes we were just talking about that. So happy to be here. Yeah, that's great, man. And, and you obviously are well versed in the podcast world. Uh, you you had a podcast while you were playing ball. And I thought it was fantastic. You're obviously a well-spoken guy doing amazing things uh, post-career. We all love watching you on the field, but um, we knew from the get-go just with the way that you handle yourself and the type of person you are, you're going to have an awesome career post-ball. So let's dive into it, man. Let's go back to the high school days, obviously out in North Carolina. Give us a little bit of your background growing up, family life, uh, what it was like to be out there in North Carolina playing high school ball. Yeah, man. So growing up, I played three sports, three sports. I played baseball, which was actually my first love. OK, I played basketball and I really didn't catch on. Football was the last sport that I started playing. I, I played when I was little pop one. I think I did pop Warner for one or two years. And then um, once I started getting a little bit older, maybe like middle school, I think I quit for a year or two. Because the league that I played in, in order to play tight end, like in order to have the ball in my hands, I had to weigh a certain amount. And I was like, man, at the time, I think I was like 20 pounds above like the weight limit. So I'm like, Big man, ball. no way. Like there's football. No, boo, football. Like this sucks. We're not, we're, I'm not doing that. So um, I stuck to baseball and basketball, man. And honestly, if you would have asked, Anybody who knew me before the age of 13, you would have thought that I was going to the MLB. I was, um, I was traveling up and down the road from Charlotte, North Carolina to Atlanta, Georgia with my dad. I think every weekend for like two years between the ages of like 11 and 13, because that those are the ages when like sports start to get a little bit more serious. And so both my teams, my baseball and my basketball team was three and a half hours in Atlanta because at the time, like this is right before Twitter. This is right before 
um, social media and like everything starts like blowing up to where like you can see like see everything at a moment's notice. And so the competition level wasn't the same in North Carolina as it was in Atlanta. And so, um, was dialed in in baseball. And then I realized baseball, I felt like I wanted it so bad. And, you know, looking back, my parents wanted it so bad. And I just kind of got burnt out on that end. And so I stopped playing baseball. Um, basketball, I realized I wasn't going to be six, seven. You know, I'm only like six, two. So I'm like, oh, there goes that a little bit. And then, bro, I start playing bat and I start playing football back in middle school, you know, seventh grade, eighth grade. You know, I realized I'm a pretty good athlete. I always worked hard. Okay. I always worked hard, but I wasn't like the most athletically gifted. You know, I'm not like CD Lamb coming in my freshman year, you know, just juking everybody out and getting to the end zone. So I went all in on football about well, after my freshman year, after I realized I had a I had a chance to get there, get a new head coach from my rival high school, which I was gearing a transfer to. He told me to stay. And then, man, he, he helped mold me. Um, he helped, you know, turn me into not only a better worker, but a better athlete, a smarter football player. So shout out to Aaron Brand, my former coach. Lincoln, who's at East Carolina. Um, he gets, you know, some type of recruiting information on me my sophomore year. He transfers to Oklahoma, joins you in the gang, um, transforms that offense over the years. And I pull up in 2017 in January, man. And, and the rest of Sooner Nation knows his history. So, um, I've always been a, been a, a, a pretty decent athlete, never extremely talented, but always worked hard. And I think that attitude, as you know, is, and Dimitri is in like anybody who's ever played fullback. You kind of got to have that grind it out type of attitude and uh, shoot all the rest of the Oklahoma fans, all the rest. So that's how I got to OU. I love it, man. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, Connor and I talked about this before. Having parents that support your dreams growing up is huge, right? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it, you know, your pops throwing you in the car and driving down and, and going to games. And, you know, obviously – it didn't pay dividends on the basketball court and, and the and the in the baseball field, yeah. but it did in terms of your work ethic and, and just kind of developing that identity to go compete. And then you got to do it at the highest level. And so, yeah, that was right around the time where we were wrapping up, uh, Connor and I. Connor, obviously, one more year at OU than I was. I think the year before you got there was was the last year. But um, talk a little bit about Lincoln. Um, obviously, a guy that while he was recruiting you, was getting maybe not his big break, but his second really big break. Uh, just talk – I've speak, spoken extremely highly of Lincoln over the years. I know a lot of OU fans, you know, have uh, feel some type of way about him, you know, with his departure going to USC. But from an X's and O's standpoint, from a culture standpoint, I really think that there's not a whole lot that are, that are better than him. So as he was recruiting you and then having the opportunity to play for him, just talk a little bit about what what that meant to you, what he meant to you, and, and your thoughts on on Lincoln Riley. Yeah. So let me preface my experience at OU was from 2017 to 2021, and looking back over that time period, those were some valuable years in terms of just being with Lincoln, seeing Bob come back, seeing Bob Lee winning all those Big Twelve championships, going from just eight win team a couple of years before that um, back when you guys were there and then going on that run that we had. And so seeing all the change and seeing link go from being an OC to head coach transferring out, I've, I've been able to look back now it's 2024 and just go, man, not only did I learn a lot from that, but I'm sure that he did as well. So growing up in high school, we all, we always, you know, knew East Carolina was pretty decent. But when I was there in high school and like visiting, like Eastern Carolina was like whooping up on teams. Like I'm talking Virginia, Chapel Hill, North Carolina State. And so you just knew that like Lincoln had some, like he was special in some way, you know, for to go from Eastern Carolina to be whooping up on D1 schools. That'd be like um, University of Tulsa, you know, competing with the University of Oklahoma. And winning. And so when he got to OU, 
And I saw what he was doing there. Um, Connor, I think it might have been your last year, 2015, mm-hmm. 16. Didi Westbrook, Baker comes in, you know, Trev, you're there. Like all that type of stuff is going on. And he still finds a way to win. Okay. Um, that was special. Now, what I will say is when I got to OU in January of 17, Lincoln wasn't the head coach yet. Okay, Bob so was I, still a head guy until Bob was, for what? Yeah, Bob was still the head guy. As a matter of fact, it was Bob, Jay Bulware, and um, uh, what was the receivers coach that I had? Um, I would remember his name any other day. But those three guys came to my house for my house visit. I didn't even see Lincoln on my – or actually – what, was it Lincoln did pull up for my house visit. Yeah, Lincoln did pull up for my house visit. Um, and so Lincoln was still like the, the second guy. Now, what I've kind of like gathered looking at the very beginning of Lincoln compared to head coach Lincoln is that Lincoln was much more relaxed as an offensive guy. He was that that was like his 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 sweet spot, in my opinion. That's where everybody on offense didn't really feel like overwhelmed a little bit. And and then and like just hearing the stories. Now, 17, he becomes the head coach. And now I'm talking to, you know, a, I'm not going to list any names, but like guys that were there pre Lincoln and the guys that were their head coach. He started tightening down a little bit, figuring out his way as a head coach. And as the years went on, you could feel that tighten up just a little bit more each year. And I feel that Lincoln had to grow up a little bit and not necessarily the mindset didn't necessarily change, but his the way that he carried himself changed a little bit. He didn't joke around as much. He was he was much more serious. I felt like he 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 was developing into like this old head at such a young age. And I don't know if I necessarily liked it, but who am I to judge as an 18, 19 year old kid to tell this man who's successful how to be a head coach? And so by the time I leave and by the time Lincoln moves to USC, he's not the same guy as what he was as when he first got there. And now I'm, be, I'm able to see this now, 20, what, 25 going on 26 this year. And so I don't know if the change was necessary, but we did see a change. And Lincoln was starting to think more like he was trying to be more like um, a Saban. He was trying to be more like... Um, uh, Venables, because he would always bring in those same speakers who had just left Clemson, who had just left Bama. You know, he'd always pull from them, in which obviously, who wouldn't? They're winning national championships, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, I felt like by the time, by the time 2020 comes around and 2021, that season, and then he ends up leaving, he's not the same guy as 2015 Lincoln, okay? He's had to grow up a little bit. And so um, I'd say early Lincoln was a little bit more fun. Um, I think latter Lincoln was a little bit more, I don't know, I, I feel like his heart kind of hardened up a little bit. Still the same, you know, still love football, but um, it just wasn't the same. And obviously we see him go to USC. So my opinion on him leaving is that I'm appreciative. I'm so appreciative for Lincoln coming to go get a little old three-star from Charlotte, North Carolina, who didn't have an offer bigger than Oklahoma. Lord have mercy. That changed my life. And that Oklahoma was the best decision I've ever made. But I don't know if I necessarily agree with how he left. I feel like we deserved, especially me as a captain, I deserved a little bit more honesty. You know, I don't, but I don't, I don't know if that's me like thinking that I deserve that, you know, cause at the end of the day, I don't deserve anything, but I, I feel like it probably would have helped us as a fan base and us as a, me as a, a player at that time. So um, I still love Link because I'm grateful for me. Now, if you ask, you know, one of the younger guys, they might say something else because, you know, obviously, but um, at the end of the day, um, he gave me an opportunity and I took advantage of it. So for that, I'm always say thank you. Love that. Dude, I want to, so kind of speaking on Lincoln and, you know, your road to owe you how much of watching what, he was doing with fullback specifically Dimitri in games. How much did that get you fired up and like influence your decision to come to OU knowing that you could be that guy in the offense? Um, right. Like 20, 
2016, I don't mean to cut you off, but I, I know where you're going. 2016 and 2017, Dimitri Flowers is all I needed to see to reassure the fact that I was going to go to the University of Oklahoma. I, I was texting Meech every week, just saying good luck. And, you know, we were just talking off and on. Um, I remember he's playing Iowa State 2017, um, 2016, 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, Joe's out. Samaje's out. Meech has to come in and play running back. I think Meech finishes that game with over 150, I think 160, 150, 170 total yards. Had like two touchdowns. And I remember seeing that game and I had to make sure I had the right mindset, okay? I didn't want to be exactly like Dimitri, Mm -hmm. but I knew that if they, if Lincoln was giving Dimitri the opportunity to have those touches in the backfield, then I knew at least the opportunity would be there for me. Now, whether I would be taking advantage of that and actually getting it and making it happen, who knew? But at least I knew that it was there. And so that was all I needed to say, hey, like, I, at that point, I had already committed, but seeing him actually, you know, get in that role and grow over the years, I'm like, oh, man, if I could just grow like he did, I'll be better. I'll be as good, if not better, than Meech. And that was always the goal. I told him that. I told him on my official, and I told him when I was being recruited, I'm like, bro, I'm going to be better than you. Like, you're great, um, and you're Baker's guy. He, people love you, but I'm going to be better. And he, he knows that. I told him that to this day. <laughs> It's, and I think that the position that you guys play, and, and let me take an aside. Do you guys, what, what means more to you? Do you want to be called an H back, a full back, or a tight end? I mean, what's the cool thing, right. right? When you're, when somebody approaches you and they ask you, Hey, what position do you play? Yeah. If you say tight end, you're like, okay, you stick your hand in the dirt. Like you got some grit to you. If you say H back, you're like, okay, you can kind of do it all. You say fullback, now you're just a, a meathead, yeah. you know, that can't catch the ball, can't get his head around when he's going in the flat. So what what's the what's the politically correct answer on that? Man, look, when I first got there, I hated being called a fullback. I'm like, I am not a fullback. I am not a full I am not don't you call me a fullback, okay? I embraced H back. That was my thing at the time. But um honestly, as I got older, I didn't care what you called me because I knew you knew I was gonna make plays. So no doubt that was, and, and, and to, to Connor's question, I thought it was, it was great that, you know, Lincoln did a great job. I thought during your tenure and Dimitri's tenure and, and it really his whole time at OU of finding ways to use you guys in the offense to where it made sense. I mean, it, it makes sense to get the ball in y'all's hands, right? Yeah. But obviously while you were there switching gears a little bit, you had some distributors of the football. And I look back on my career and I was a great athlete and I ran the ball a lot and, and I was a, I was a good quarterback, but I was a, I was an athlete playing quarterback. Yeah. But my predecessors at Oklahoma, Baker, Tyler, Jalen, Spencer, even Caleb, I mean, all of them since then, even to today, I would call true distributors of the football. Mm-hmm. And I think that your time frame there at OU was unique because Bake was there when you got there, right? And then you – so Heisman year, and then back-to-back Heisman year with Kyler the next year who you got to play with. And then you had uh, then you had Jalen who didn't win the Heisman, but he had one of the best seasons in Oklahoma quarterback history, right? And obviously he's gone up from there. And then you had both Spencer and, and Caleb, right? And I know that there was some – Rocky roads there, but but two great players, one that could very well potentially be the first overall pick. So from a quarterback standpoint, you had some of the best that the Crimson and Cream have ever seen. Yeah. Talk a little bit. You can talk individually about each one of those guys if you want, but holistically, talk about just the, the fibers that those type of guys have. What was the same about each one of them that allowed them to be so successful? Yeah. I'd say that they were all different in their own ways. Um, Baker, Baker was a, a special talent and a special person, like in terms of his character. You know, as, as you know, Baker, obviously, just with his, his performance on the field goes without saying, but his ability to make his team better in all areas, like mentally, and on the field was second to none. I don't think, I don't think anybody, the rest of the quarterbacks that I had 
didn't have that ability to just gather a team like Baker did because he came in every day. You know, he was going to work. You know, he was going to have energy. He treated everybody the same, whether young or old. You know, I remember my freshman year. Just, I remember, I'll never forget my first meeting. We were still, the facility was being, was being made. We were still over in the, um, over the, the portables, uh, man. That's where yeah, I yeah, we were, we were in the trailer. The real ones remember the trailers, bro. Like, oh, the trailers, I started man. talking to the old heads. Like, when if you could talk about the trailers, then you you've been through some struggle, okay? And so I remember Bob. Remind you, Bob's still the head coach. He's getting to start the meeting. Baker comes in, bro. And I'm an early graduate. I had just turned 18. I I was watching this dude on TV like two months ago, and I see him come in. I'm like, bro, that's Baker Mayfield. Like, and I'm his teammate. And so to see him later on, you know, just give me the respect as his teammate of a conversation and, you know, encouraging me, that meant the world to me, man, especially, you know, him being a Heisman finalist and all that type of stuff. I don't think that I got that reassurance or encouragement from any of the rest of the quarterbacks like I did Baker. Um, now, Kyler, Kyler was a better athlete, okay, less riskier of a thrower, like Baker, Baker would throw that thing between three people, zip it. Kyler, he, he, he had the ability to do that, but he didn't have to because he could run a four, four now or, or four, three, four, two, really. And so, um, I'd say Kyler was the better athlete. Uh, Baker was the better like quarterback in terms of up here, you know, knowledge. Um, Kyler could go out there and make a play and, you know, we all know Kyler's great. Jalen. Jalen was not as good as an athlete as Kyler, stronger than Baker, but just a step down from Baker and, and Kyler, like football wise, which is crazy to say because he's the one that's been to the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's I don't I don't know how you it, I don't, it's tough, bro, comparing Jalen Mayfield to two a step down yeah. from back to back Heisman winners. Though. Yeah, yeah, you know, and then he's the one in the Super Bowl making the most money, which is weird to say. But at the same time, Jalen was so laser focused, bro. Like Jalen's interviews is the same way that he is in person. Um, not like the moxie character type of guy. He's not gonna go crazy like Baker and run around the whole stadium. But he does know how to articulate and, and capture his team's attention. I'd say Jalen was a great leader. Um, probably a more square, narrow type of leader, but he always got the job done and that boy lifted. He worked hard in the weight room and, and he knew how to like make other people work hard. Uh, Caleb, Caleb was probably the most talented of every, of any, any of them. Um, size, speed, um, height, ability. He could probably throw the ball the farthest and, but he was just young. And he, he was young. He was, Jay, I think Caleb was seven, 17 when he first got there. Um, as, a, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you a quick story about Caleb real quick. And then, then I'll touch on Spencer. Um, oh, I'll touch, I'll, I'll tell you about Caleb after I touch on Spencer. So Spencer, Spencer had the, probably the most ability to comprehend football up here. Spencer, Spencer's a very smart. Um, yeah. football player. He understands football very well, but I don't, I don't, I don't think that his attitude benefited him at being handed the reins at such a young age. You know, like Spencer, he came in and he had Jalen for a year and then bam, you know, he knew he was going to be that guy. So I, I don't know. I think maybe a little bit more adversity would have benefited his cause to have a guy like Jalen for a little bit longer, a guy like Baker for a little bit longer, just to say, hey, bro, like, these are the mistakes that I made. I think that we can change your direction a little bit because he, I think that Spencer deserved a place to shine, but I don't, I never want to speak down to anybody, but he had a lot of, a lot more growing up to do. Um, I think he has talked about that too, since he went to South Carolina, how much growing up he did. And now putting himself in a position to, you know, hopefully get drafted and contribute in the NFL. But I think he's touched on that. He he kind of knew the same thing you're talking about. Yeah. Well, well, when you look at the other three guys, not only were they incredible players, but they were all in the back end of their career by the time they got to OU. I mean, Baker came towards the beginning, but he was a transfer, right? Right. And he had already played ball at Tech. And then obviously Kyler comes from A&M. He had already gone through his growing pains there. Yeah. And then Jalen – 
played in, at an incredibly high level and was at Alabama, which is the Holy Grail, and learned how to be a pro there. So I'm sure from your seat, Jeremiah, that was nothing against Spencer, but a step down in terms of leadership yeah. and, and just maturity. Yeah, and Lee, Lincoln talked about that to me. He tried to pull that out of me. And um, what, it was me and Creed Spencer's junior year. Yeah, me, me Creed were the older guys. But man, like honestly, I I wasn't ready to like replace the role of Jalen Hurts, yeah. of Kyler Murray, because I was still growing. Like I don't think I was confident in myself as a captain until like my fourth year, like my red shirt junior year. Like I had a lot of growing up to do. Um and football wise. Mentally I could have done it. Like mentally I was there. But you can't you can't lead if you're not like making plays. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's very hard to lead if the team doesn't, like, say, hey, like, he's our go-to guy. And I didn't become that until later in my career. And so um, Spencer was kind of leading blind. And uh, I was there, you know, obviously helping and, you know, trying to do my part as a leader. But I just, looking back, I wasn't where I wish that I was, you know. Yeah. Um but here, just to uh, tell you a quick story about Caleb. This is when I knew this kid was cold. Now everybody says they knew, but I I knew, and I got a I got a record of it too, man. So spring ball, I think right around this time, two two three years ago, I called my dad in the middle of spring ball one day. He was like, "Uh, what you think about Caleb?" I said, "You know, pops, this kid might be winning the quarterback battle." And I didn't say that because he was throwing the tight ends the ball every play. Like, I'm talking, it was me, Austin Stogner, Brady, and Willis all in the same room. We was routing the safeties up, boy. We was routing the safeties up. I'm talking like, <laughs> we look, the H-backs, spring 2021. Ooh, boy, we was a sight to see, boy. We was Jeez, a sight baby, to see. It was a sight to see. Like, I'm, I'm talking like we every everything that, like, I was just cultivating those first four years just came together. Spring ball, man, we killed it. And Caleb was dishing us the rock. Caleb was dishing us the rock. So I called my dad one day. I said, Dad, if we were to play a football game today, I think Caleb might start. I said, might. I said, might. I love Spencer, but I think Caleb might start. Fast forward to the front. You know, Spencer ends up coming back. You know, you know how it is in spring ball. You start out with the basic plays, and then Lincoln starts to throw some sauce in there. You know, you got to keep up. And so – Caleb started out good with the basics, but, you know, as we, like, started to advance the playbook, he's still finishing high school, starting college, all that type of stuff. I'm sure it stressed him out. Uh, Spencer came back and took number one. As you know, fast forward to Texas, Spencer gets pulled out. You know, we want Caleb. Spencer, Caleb comes in, bro, and I was just, it just, you know, the rest of the story just plays out as we all know it to this day, but, man. Did I think it was going to happen like that? No, sir. Am I grateful to be a part of one of the greatest comebacks in the history of college football? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, we were in the stands. Yeah, I'm, Connor and I were both in the stands. I think Connor had a shirt off at some point. We I, I didn't have my shirt off. I'm grateful to have had a beer in my hand in that one. Because first <laughs> yeah, half, I, I was about to leave. And then I, we got to stick this out, man. Yeah, I'm glad yeah, you stayed. Yeah, yeah. That was that was awesome, and you can respect this being on the other side, Jeremiah. It's so fun to be on the. I mean, obviously, you wish you'd, you're out on the field, right? Yeah. But it's so fun to be on the back end and watch these guys go compete because you've been there. You know what it takes. Yeah. You know the energy. You know the passion. You know the the X's and O's and and, and the the hours in the weight room, the hours in the film room that it takes to go out and compete. And when things aren't going your way, it's like golly, it's such an emotional drain. But a comeback that reignites the whole fan base. Oh man, it was awesome, especially in that one. Yeah, especially in that one. Oh, um, so yeah, that was great. So obviously, that was one of your more favorite games yeah. uh, of your career. What's one more that just sticks out top of your mind? You're like, man, that was that was really cool. And you got to play in a couple college football playoff games and some really really cool venues. But what's one that you remember? Whether it's because of a personal accomplishment or or just the game in general. Um, definitely my last game and I almost get teared out just thinking about it, but, um, mm -hmm. it was my, it was my last game as a Sooner, but my first game to ever play under Bob Stoops. Mm -hmm. And it was his last game that he's coached as a college football coach ever. 
And so to come in with the guy who recruited you and to go out with him was, I don't know, it was, it was just something special about that. Cause that whole week, it was just about having fun, bro. Like Bob came in and uh, yes, he had the head coaching title, but, um, he wasn't like, like coaching, coaching for real. Like he was, he was, he was coaching and he was, you know, tidbits and everything, but man, Bob was just having fun in practice. Um, he, we would, you know, all the captains do like all the media and stuff with the head coach that week, all game, um, the Alamo bowl. And, um, I got to hang out with Bob and limos, talk to him behind closed doors and just, just hang out with the guy who made all your dreams come true. Cause you know, the head coach signs off on all offers. And so uh, to have that week with him is, um, was, was special to me and, um, Probably something that I'll talk about with my kids for the rest of my life because who knows if Bob will ever coach in college again. So uh, I'd, I'd say Alamo Bowl 20, 2021. That was uh, probably my second favorite, yeah. I love it. Uh, Connie, got anything for Jeremiah? We'll wrap up here in a few minutes. I do want to get your outlook on the on the 2024 Sooners. Uh, but, Con, what do you got for Jeremiah? Yeah, dude, for, but we need to have you back on because there's a bunch of stuff we didn't cover about your career, big plays, all that. So we, we definitely need to get you back on. But, dude, I'm just sitting here thinking the quarterbacks that you played with, their oh. combined net worth right now, I mean, Baker, 100 mil, Kyler, couple hundred mil, Jalen, couple hundred mil, Caleb about to be, you know, however much, Spencer, yeah. you know, if he signs, I mean, you need to start texting those dudes, say, hey, can I hold, <laughs> can I hold like a thousand bucks? <laughs> <laughs> bro, half a billion dollars worth of quarterbacks in my back pocket. Huh? That's, That's crazy, crazy, man. That's crazy. crazy. I know, but, you know, as, go ahead, Trev. No, no, go ahead, Con. Sorry. No, just, um, you know, thinking about spring ball getting started, I think they had the first week before they hit um, spring break. You know, guys all over the place right now, but as they come back, you know, what's a – what's a big storyline you want to see coming out of spring? You know, whether it be a posi- position group, whether it be, you know, an individual guy, you, you always hear those storylines. This guy made huge strides in spring ball. This guy, you know, he's primed to do big things. What's one player, one group that, that you're really looking forward to, you know, hearing good things about? I want to see the offensive line dominate consistently. Yeah. Don- consistently, bro. Like, I'm, like I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm spo- – I probably am, okay, because I, I played on some of the best uh, offensive – offenses in, in – college history yeah they won the joe moore while, while you were there didn't they yeah they, yeah I, I yeah joe moore wore 27 no 2018 yep. um rose bowl 2017 yeah you you know the resume but mm-hmm. i'm just so used to seeing that and being able to run the football consistently now i'm not i'm not saying like two three yards like i'm saying bus seven eight nine fifteen twenty yards consistently you know and uh, we just didn't get that last year, man, and it bothered me a lot. You know, it, it really did. I'm, I know Venables is handling the defense. I got the podcast with Danny and the boys, but um, I would like to see the offensive line protect the quarterback um, a lot more, just be more consistent with it this year and be able to run the ball, man, because uh, I know the fans are talking about the SEC. And I'll tell you this, as someone who's experienced both, and Trevor, I'm sorry you can talk about this, the biggest difference between the Big 12 and the SEC, in my opinion, is the line. Yep. Okay. Cause I remember playing LSU Peach Bowl 2019 with Jalen Hurts as my quarterback. We got in the huddle first play and I'm looking over to the other side and it's 310, 325, 330 across the board. Yeah. The Big 12 just doesn't have that. So. Um, I would like to see some improvements from the offensive line. I got all the faith in the world of Beatenbo, though, so I'm not too worried. Uh, We've talked about that a lot. Bill Beatenbo is the guy for the job, and there will be a transition going into the SEC. And that's what I say. I got to play in both conferences, you know, my senior year being down at A&M, playing in the SEC West, playing at Mississippi State, playing at Alabama, uh, playing against LSU, all those guys that you just mentioned. And that is the biggest difference. It's just the stature. I mean, these guys are huge. Uh, they can play two gap football. They can, they can, you know, really stuff you at the line and you got to win the game at the line of scrimmage. And I love your answer there, Jay Hall, because a lot of people, most people are saying, Hey, I want to see Jackson Arnold. I want to see how he comes out. We've heard so much and we do. I know we all do, but 
what's going to win us games down the stretch, especially in this league, is winning the game at the line of scrimmage and running the football effectively. All the back end stuff, Seth Luttrell will dial stuff up. Lincoln Riley dialed stuff up. You know, we'll, we'll always have people that will dial stuff up in the passing game. But I, I love the hats that people wear. Run the damn ball, right? Yeah. Because that's, that's cool. still the name of this game, especially in this league. So it, it's going to be a lot of fun. So with that, let me ask you this last question, then we'll wrap up. What, what are your predictions, thoughts um, on the 2024 Sooners? How are we going to fare with first year in the SEC? Um, and, and then maybe if you want to finish up with just your overall thoughts on Brent Venables and how he's been leading this program. Man, I, it's hard to make a prediction because there's so much new. We got a new quarterback. Um, we got Seth Latrell stepping up. Um, I don't know if they're going to keep the system the same. I don't know what tweaks they're making. Um, beating Bo certainly won't want to change up too much knowing him. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't really have an answer for you prediction wise. I'm hoping that we compete. Um, I can't just say outright SEC championship. We got Nick Saban gone. Um, I'm sure all the rest of the SEC coaches are, are, are chomping at the bit. So, um, man, I, I don't know, but I'm going to practice next week and I'll probably have a better answer for you. We can do a part two. So, uh, let, let's see what the, Let's see what the boys are looking like before I start answering. Bron- hey, Bron- hey, get your facts straight before you answer it. But overall yeah. thoughts here to wrap up, uh, Brett Venables, what he's done coming in and, and taking over, um, you know, a program that had a lot of guys leave that was in quote unquote turmoil um, and, and how he's kind of pulled us out of that. What do you think of, uh, what do you think of BB? I think, I think Brent has done a great job of adjusting to the new age of football because let, let's remember when he won all those championships. Okay. The transfer portal wasn't really as active as what it is, uh, now. Okay. He had players who are already there that grew into the system. Okay. And then he didn't have such inconsistencies at quarterback. You know, he's, you know, now he's got a new one. Okay. Now he's got a new OC. Now he's entering to a new conference after just entering, after just like getting to Oklahoma. So, man, he's facing a lot of change. A lot of, I don't know when's the last time you've been to the facility, Trev, but there's so many new faces. The staff is huge now. Like there's just been so much change and he's just running with it. So uh, we'll see what the season looks like to come. But I think so far he's doing a great job of rolling with the punches. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to spring ball. Spring ball, baby, right around the corner. Well, Jay Hall, man, thanks for coming on. I know we dove deep into a, a lot of different things here. We do need to have you back on because I think there's so much more to cover. Oh, man. I think I- you provide such great insight to uh, not only the past, but the present as well, and then even the future of Sooner football. So number 27 on the field, number one in your hearts, Jeremiah Hall. Thanks there for joining go. us. This is the Dial It Up pod with Trevor Knight and Connor Knight. We'll see you next time.